that I have the, the Word of God in my hand. I know that what I'm, what I'm preaching is right. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless this message as it's preached. And I just pray that every, every child, every adult that's here would listen up and, and learn the truth from the Bible. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, I've been, I've been disturbed different places that I've gone and different people that I've talked to. I've been disturbed with, how, especially among children, among uh, young teenagers and kids, how many people don't understand uh, the subject that I'm going to preach on uh, this morning. I've, a- I've heard people ask a question uh, about somebody that's maybe in some kind of a distant jungle somewhere. You know, an imaginary story that people use, a, a hypothetical situation about a person that grew up in the jungles of Africa somewhere or somewhere in East India and they've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've never heard the Bible. And maybe they've never even heard the name of Jesus. And I've heard people ask this question, will God send such a person to hell? That's never. Do you know the answer to that question this morning? And I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands or anything like that. But do you know the answer to the question... A man who's never heard the gospel, a man who's never heard the words of God, a man who's never heard the name of Jesus Christ, will God send that person to hell if he dies without being saved? Well, as we read here in in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, look down if you would, the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, and these are the key words, to everyone that believeth. See, that's the deciding factor of who's going to be saved. Everyone that believes it. Now, the, the question, turn if you would just one page over to Romans chapter 3. And uh, let's read a few more scriptures before we get into the sermon. But Romans chapter 3, look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all there together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then jump down to verse 19, if you would. The Bible reads, Now ye know, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You see, when God's laws were given to mankind, when God spoke the words of God, the Bible says that the whole world... Everybody in the world became guilty before God. He says there's no excuse for anybody we saw in Romans chapter 1. The Bible says that the, the manifestation of God is in the natural world that he created. He said anybody can look around at this world. Anybody can see from the natural world that God has created that there really is a God. And that God created this world. And that there's a God that someday we have to answer to because of God's laws that he spoke and that he manifested through his creation. Now, what is it that, ask yourself this question, what is it that sends a person to hell? Why do people go to hell? Well, the Bible reads in uh, Romans 6.23, not to turn there, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And, of course, we know that after death, death is not the end, okay? After the physical death, there's the second death. And the second death is when you go to hell, is when you go to the lake of fire and burn in hell. Well, ask yourself this question. Why did Jesus Christ go to hell? You say, Jesus Christ went to hell? Absolutely. If you have a King James Bible, Jesus Christ went to hell. Because the Bible says, This spake he of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. See, the resurrection of Christ was when Jesus' soul came up out of hell. Up from the grave he arose. Hey, the resurrection of Christ was a resurrection from hell, why did Jesus go to hell? Well, because he was bearing the sins of the whole world. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, and then he took our sins down to hell and paid for them, and three days later he rose again from the dead. You say, well, I don't, I don't believe that. I'm not sure if Jesus really went to hell. Hey, why don't you get a King James Bible, and why don't you believe when the Bible says that Jesus went to hell? Oh, he went to Hades and Sheol. Hey, I don't know what the Sheol you're talking about, my friend, because the Bible says hell, and my Bible doesn't say, I don't even know what Hades is. I hope I never know what Hades and Sheol is. You say, you're uneducated. Hey, I'm educated in this book. Get Get educated in this book. So what sends a person to hell is, is, is the sins that you've committed. The Bible says all liars. You know, God even names some sins. He says all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, uh, is the person who's never heard of Jesus Christ, are they still a sinner? 
Right? Are you, are, you, are you listening? Are you listening this morning? Can you hear what I'm saying? Hey, if the person who's never heard of Jesus Christ, are they still a sinner? Then they're still guilty before God, and they still deserve to go to hell when they die. So, that's what we know what gets a person to hell, clearly from the Bible. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Okay, but, but do we know what gets a person to heaven? Well, we already talked about that. One word is what gets you to heaven. Believe. One word. The whole gospel. You say, is, is the gospel complicated? How, how long is it going to take you to explain the gospel? Hey, I can explain it. I'll explain it for you right now. What salvation is, it's believe. One word. Believe. Faith. Now, the Bible reads that we already saw it. Everyone that believeth in Romans 1.16. Romans 3.26. You're already looking in Romans chapter 3. Look down at a great verse in verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. Okay, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. See, salvation is for everyone that believeth. Uh, you say, what about, what about somebody who's, a, who's a, a wicked sinner? Hey, it's for everyone that believeth. They're saved. It's, it's whosoever believeth in Him, John 3.16, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 1 John 5, 1. Don't turn there. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Faith is believing. That's all it means. Uh, and then not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I had a, I had a few uh, Mormons visit my church uh, several months ago. And it, it, it was interesting because it was a, it was a girl, that was a, she was a young college-age girl, and uh, she was actually assigned by college to visit a church of another religion, okay? And so she chose Baptist. She said, well, I went on the internet and I was searching for a church to visit in Phoenix because my school had said I couldn't go to one of my own religion. I had to pick another religion. You know, she's a Mormon, born and raised. And she said, uh, she said I saw that you used the King James Bible and I thought, okay, that's what we as Mormons use. We use the King James Bible. And she said there was a lot that I liked about uh, what I saw on your website. And so she said, you know, I'm going to come. She called first and said, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring my mother. And we're going to come and we're going to write a, a paper about what Baptists believe. And we're going to come to your church and do that. And uh, we, she came out and, and uh, she was taking notes for the first ten minutes of my sermon until I just started screaming and yelling. You know, and she just kind of put the pen down and... And looked up, she couldn't believe it, you know, because that's not the way they preach in the Mormon church at all, okay? And I asked her afterward, because I've never been to a Mormon church, so I asked her, I said, is this the way that they preach? She said, no, <laughs> it's not it at all, okay? It's a lot different. But uh, she was talking to me afterward, and I, and I gave her the gospel after the service. You know, I, I, t I talked to her, and I went through salvation, and boy, she was so close to getting saved. And I, I pray to God that one day she will get saved. I think, I think maybe she will. I think maybe that's why she was there, to get the seed planted. And I talked to her, and this is what she said to me. She said, well, what about, this is what she said, what about repentance? Because I showed her, it's believe, faith, faith, believe, believe. And she said to me, uh, what about repentance? She said, in the Mormon church, we're taught that you must repent of your sins to be saved. That's what we're taught as Mormons. And I told her, I said, that's not, I said, can you show me that in the Bible? Can you show me these words in the Bible, repent of your sins? No. It's not there. Okay, the Bible talks about repent and believe the gospel. The Bible says they repented not afterward that they should believe on him. See, they didn't repent from not believing and begin to believe on Jesus, right? They didn't change what they believed. He said, see, the Jews, when Jesus came on the scene, they believed law. And Jesus Christ preached to them. Many of them repented and believed the truth of salvation by faith. And many would not repent and believe on Jesus Christ. But see, what, what she meant, this is what she meant. When she said, repent of your sins, she meant that you have to be willing to give up your sins in order to be saved. Now, if you have to be willing to give up your sins in order to be saved, then I'm not saved. And neither are you, because you're not willing to give up all your sins. I'm not willing to give up all my sins to this day. I wish I were. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. But I, I, I tell you right now, I sin every day. If you be honest before God, you sin every day. 
None of us can do it. But when God says, if God said to us, repent of your sins and you'll be saved, that's a hopeless message. But if God says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, hey, that's something that I can do. That's something anybody can do. That's something you can do. You can believe on Jesus Christ. You can believe the record that God gave of His Son and say, I'm not going to make God a liar by not believing the record, but I'm going to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised Him from the dead. And God says you'll be saved. But turn, <coughs> excuse me, turn to Romans chapter 10. <coughs> Forward in your Bible, uh, you're in chapter 3, just go to chapter 10. <coughs> Look at a famous verse in Romans 10, 13. Don't ever let anybody complicate the gospel to you. You know what, all throughout the history of the world... All the way since God created man, all the way back to Cain and the Tower of Babel, and, and all false religion has always tried to find a way for man to take credit for his own salvation, instead of just receiving the free gift of eternal life by faith. Why is it so hard for people to understand? Jesus paid it all. All the him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. They have to say, no, I gave up alcohol to be saved. You know, I gave up such and such to say, hey, I didn't give up anything to be saved. I got on my knees by my bedside as a six-year-old boy. Who's six years old in here? Put up your hand if you're six years old. Hey, when I was six years old is when I got on my knees by my bedside. And you know what I did to get saved? I got on my knees and I, and I said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. I believe that without Jesus Christ, I'll go to hell. And that if I put all my faith in Jesus Christ, he'll save me right now. And you know what I did? I got on my knees and I asked Jesus Christ to save me. And that's why I'm saved today. And that was when I was six years old. See, it's easy enough for a six-year-old to understand. My younger sister got saved the next day. She was four years old. But she understood that Jesus paid it all because it's not that complicated. It's not that complicated to understand that Jesus paid it all and, and it's just, it's all Jesus. We just believe. That's all we have to do. That's salvation. Look at Romans 10, 13, famous verse in the Bible. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, what is the name of the Lord? See, it doesn't just say you call out, you know, I've heard people say, well, that guy out in the jungle that you were talking about earlier, Brother Anderson, uh, he might just look up to God, and I've, I've heard people say this, I couldn't believe my ears when I heard people saying this. There were, there were preacher's kids that said this. And they said, uh, that guy, if he just kind of looks up at the sky and sees that there's a God, and he just kind of calls out and says, God, whoever you are, I don't know who you are, but I want to go to heaven, would you save me? Hey, that's not enough to get you to heaven. Because you've got to call upon the name of the Lord. See, there's none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ, that at the name of Jesus Christ... Every knee should bow, and every tongue confess of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Because uh, you can't just stop reading in Romans 10.13. Look at the next words. It's so clear what the Bible teaches. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? It all comes back to believe again, always. How can they call on him and whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? How are you going to believe on somebody you've never heard of? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things, or that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And look at verse 16. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. See, not everybody's saved. They've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. See, that's why they're not saved. They didn't believe the report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And you say, okay, what about that guy that's in the jungle? Well, we're going to read about him in verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. See, God has manifested himself through creation. God has sent preachers throughout the centuries to preach in all these areas. You don't think there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of preachers who've taken the gospel to Africa over the years? You don't think there have been hundreds and hundreds and thousands of preachers who've taken the gospel to every corner of the world? Hey, the Bible says so. The Bible says this gospel, in Matthew 24, the gospel will be preached to every nation under heaven. Well, when you get to heaven, you're going to see a great multitude of people 
described in Revelation chapter 7 and described in Revelation 15 that's from all kindreds, all families, all nations, all tongues will be represented. Yes, the gospel has gone forth into the world. The problem is that they've not all believed the gospel and that's why they're not saved because they didn't believe the gospel that their sins might be forgiven. But even if a specific person did not hear the name of Jesus, even if a specific person did not hear a clear presentation of the gospel, they're still guilty before God for the sins that they've committed in their body and they will pay for them in hell. That's the truth. You better, you better get that nailed down. You better understand that that's what the Bible teaches. Maybe that will make you a soul winner. What is it that gets people saved? What is it? Well, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, the Bible says. You remember the parable of the sower? Remember the parable in the Bible where the sower sows the seed and some falls on the good ground? Some falls in the stony places? Some falls by the wayside? And uh, you remember that parable? Put up your hand if you know that story about Jesus from the Bible. You, you know... All of those, when he explains those in Matthew 13, first of all, he said, the sower sows the word. The seed that that sower has thrown out. He said, that he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus Christ is the sower in the parable of the sower. Uh, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The Bible says, uh, the sower soweth the word in the book of Mark. Okay, so that's the word of God. In every explanation of that parable... When Jesus explains what each of those four uh, groups of people are, each time he says, uh, He that received the sown of the stony place is he which heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. And uh, everything he just says, they hear the word, that's always the first step. In all four explanations of the parable, so read Matthew 13 later and you'll see that, it's always, they hear the word of God. When I, I talked about when I was six years old, I got saved. You know the verse that was showed to me when I got saved was John 5.24? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The Bible says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. James chapter 1, of his own will, begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The Bible says in the same chapter that we're to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. See, you've got to hear God's word to be saved. You've got to hear the name of Jesus Christ to be saved. And then you've got to decide that you're going to believe the record that God gave His Son. Salvation is hearing God's word. Hearing the name of Jesus Christ. Hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and saying, I believe the gospel. I believe that it's not of works. I believe that Jesus paid it all. Yeah, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Now, instead of denying that fact, instead of saying, well, I just don't believe that a loving God would send someone to hell who's never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. I just don't believe that a loving God would send someone to hell unless they had every chance in the world where somebody brought them a Bible and showed them, hey, God will just give them a pass. Hey, instead of crying and whining about that, why don't you be the one to go tell those people the gospel? Think about how silly this is. People who believe that those people who've never heard the gospel, will, they'll get a free pass into heaven. Why in the world would you ever send out a missionary? If you didn't send the missionary, those people would be better off. Right? I mean, with that dumb logic. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking false right now. But if, if, if you brought the gospel to that tribe in the dark jungle somewhere, and half the people received it, and half the people did not receive it, you just damned half those people to hell. You'd be better off to just leave them alone, you know, let them do their own thing, leave them isolated. No, but God says, uh, we must preach the gospel to every creature. Hey, the love of Christ constraineth us. Hey, hey, the love of Christ must motivate us to love the unsaved. Hey, to love that guy who's never heard the gospel. And it's not just a guy over in Africa that's never heard the gospel. Hey, it's not just somebody in India that's never heard the gospel. I guarantee you that there are people in the United States of America that have never heard the word of God. They've never heard the gospel explained. They've never heard the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll guarantee you that they're here in Four Corners, New Mexico. They're in this area. I promise you that. I promise you that. Hey, get them the gospel. 
Don't sit around and cry and say, God's not fair. No, you're not fair. Hey, you're not fair because you are hiding your light under a bushel. Hey, you're not sharing what you've received. You're not sharing the free gift of the gospel with everybody. Hey, you're not fair. Don't hoard the gospel for yourself. Hey, why don't you get everybody saved? You can't. Why don't you at least give them a chance? Why don't you at least tell them the truth? Hey, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We wouldn't even be having this conversation right now about whether people who've never heard the gospel will still go to hell. Because everybody would have heard the gospel if we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. Say, how, you say, how are we going to do it? How are we going to get the gospel out to the world? Well, God has, a, God has a very specific method that he uses for getting the gospel out to the whole world. You say, Brother Anderson, I've got an idea. This is what we need to do. We need to get a TV camera, okay? Get a, get a, get a big TV antenna. And uh, let's, get some, let's get some great preacher up there. And let's have him preach the gospel over the airwaves to the entire world on a television screen. Do you think that's God's plan to get the gospel out to the world? Is that what the Bible says God's plan is? No, it's not God's plan. See, God has a plan, and God's plan works. The problem is we need to be following God's plan. This is God's plan. It's called one-on-one personal soul winning. One-on-one personal soul winning. It's called me walking up to somebody who's not saved and taking the time just personally with that one person and getting him saved and giving him the gospel, opening my Bible and showing him the gospel. You say, wait a minute, that's not very efficient. That's going to take too long. You should preach to thousands and millions of people at one time. That would be so much faster. Well, what did Jesus do? Jesus stopped by the woman at the well... He stopped at the, at the well where a woman was that had been divorced and remarried five times. And now she was living in sin with a man. He stopped everything. He stopped where he was going. He, he, he stopped dealing with the disciples. And he stopped everything and said, I'm going to take the time to just get this one person saved one-on-one personally. Now, look, if anybody could have had a great crowd listening to him all the time, it would have been Jesus Christ. But you'll see him again and again taking the time to sit down with Nicodemus and win him to the Lord one-on-one. You know, taking the time to try to, to, try to win these, these two blind men to the Lord. He went into the house. He sent everybody else out. Closed the door. He's in the house alone. He sits down with, with two blind men. And he says, believe ye that I'm able to do this? Believest, dost thou believe on the Son of God? He said in the book of John to a man that he'd healed. Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Uh, Jesus took the time for one-on-one soul winning. How many people did that woman at the well get saved? See, he took just a little time where he just only got one person saved. But then that lady, the Bible says, went on to to get multitudes of people saved in the city where she was there in Samaria. And the Bible says that many believed on him because of the word which the woman spake when she went back to that town. You see, every time you win somebody to the Lord, and uh, hopefully you can get that person to church and get them baptized... You know, and hopefully you can train them to be just like you. You can bring forth after your own kind. You can get somebody saved and then you can teach them to obey all things whatsoever Jesus Christ has commanded us, including going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Uh, anytime you do that, when you win that one person to the Lord, you might be winning a thousand people to the Lord. Because that person, I mean, you, if you win a small child, you win one of these children to the Lord. And I'll guarantee you that there are children in this room that are not saved right now. I'll promise you that. You know that's true. There's got to be there's got to be kids in here that aren't saved. You win one of these children to the Lord, that 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 child might win a thousand people to the Lord in their lifetime. You don't know who you're. Hey, you say, well, it's just a little girl. Hey, that girl may win a thousand people to the Lord. You say she's never going to stand up and preach to a great crowd. Hey, she's never going to stand up and hold some uh, preaching service. She's never going to be the pastor of the church. You're not listening. Preaching to a great crowd, pastoring a church, means nothing compared to being a personal soul winner. Well, the number one title in this church, or any church, is not pastor, it's soul winner. That's who the greatest person in this church is. That's the greatest soul winner in this church. Hey, that's the greatest in the kingdom of God, is the person who wins souls, who's fruitful. Herein is my Father glorified, Jesus said, that you bring forth much fruit. Don't ever think, well, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, I'm never going to get up and preach. I, maybe I'm a, a young boy and I know I'm just never going to stand up behind a pulpit and preach. This is not my personality. Or maybe I'm a girl and I'm not going to be the next Joyce Meyer uh, standing up and preaching to great crowds. Hey, you can be used of God. A woman can be used of God as much as a man can be used of God. Period. Because they, they can be used in the greatest thing, which is uh, soul winning. Hey, stay out of the pulpit, women. But why don't, you, why don't you get your own little personal pulpit when you stand in front of somebody's door? And instead of beating the pulpit and preaching a sermon, why don't, you, why don't you knock that door just as hard as I beat this pulpit? And then why don't you open your Bible and you can preach a sermon to them about the eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. And so, you've got to get this idea through your head that God's plan is daily in the temple and in every house. They cease not to invite people to church. That's not what it says. Uh, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts 20.20 20 talks about preaching from house to house. He preached the gospel to every creature. Let me give you a quick illustration I'll close. But I was thinking about, I love math. Who likes math in here? Favorite subject is math. My favorite subject is math. Before I, before I decided I was going to be a preacher, you know, I studied a lot of math. And I was going to, I was going to get uh, all the college degrees in mathematics. I love math. I love calculus. I, to this day, I love math. I, I mean, I still study math. For, for, uh, I, I work a secular job in the, in the fire alarm business, electronics. I do a lot of math for my job. I love math. I think God invented all math, personally. I think all math is found in the Bible if we were smart enough to, to extract it from the Bible. But, who knows what an exponent is? Put up your hand if you know what an exponent is. All right, I don't want to get too complicated. <laughs> you know what an exponent is? All right, tell me what an exponent is. <laughs> Adam, go ahead. It's, um, number, it's above another number, Exactly right. It's a little number that's in a superscript right above the number, exactly like he said, and that's how many times you will multiply that number. Okay? So if you, have a, if you have a two, for example, is the number that we're going to deal with this morning. Chapel's over. It's math time. Okay. <laughs> but you have a two, right? Well, if you put, you put exponents and you put a zero next to two, you got one. So you're getting less. Okay? But if you, you put a two and you put a one next to it, you got two. You get a two and then you put a two in the exponent, you got four. So you keep doubling. It goes one, two, four, eight. 16, you follow me, what exponents do? Exponents of 2 will make things keep doubling. So think about this for a moment. Let's say I were the only person saved in this entire world. Obviously that's ridiculous. There are millions of people that are saved. But let's say I'm the only person in the whole world who's saved, and there's only one saved Christian in the world. And what if I said, you know what, this year, 2007, I have one great goal. I'm going to get one person saved this year. One person saved. I'm not going on television. I'm not preaching some great crusade. I'm not bringing in some uh, rock band, uh, Sandy Fatty or uh, you know Amy Grunt or any of these people. I'm not going to bring in these big stars. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to. I just want to get one person saved, hey, door to door. You know? Do you think that's a pretty? Do you think that's an unreasonable goal? One person saved for the whole year? I've already seen many, many people saved this year. Uh, scores of people saved. But but what if I set a goal that's one person saved? Well, let's say I achieved my goal of getting one person. Anybody in this room could do that. And then at the end of that year, how many, pe how many people will be saved? Tell me out loud. How many people are there saved in the whole world now? Two, right? Come on, say it loud. Yeah. Two, all right. So I got two people saved now, right? And let's say I take that person, I train them and say, I, you're going to be like me. This is, this is what we do. Okay, we preach the gospel. We're soul winners. We are personal Soul winners. I mean, we take people one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's at the job, door-to-door, uh, -door, as Jesus Christ commanded, or anywhere we are, we just take one person aside and just give them the gospel. Well, let's say I teach them to do that, and I say, 2008, the second year, we're going to have one person saved each, and we're going to teach them to be like us. How many people are saved at the end of the second year? Four people saved. Okay? And then us four, we do the same thing. Now, is our church very big at this point? After two years? Good night, we only have four people in church. That's not a lot of people, that's not a very big church. But we say, okay, we're going we're to stick with God's plan. And uh, we're each going to just go out and get one person saved this year, the four of us. How many people would we have at the end of the third year? Eight. Eight people, right? 
How many people would we have at the end of the fourth year? How many people would we have at the end of the fifth year? 16. 32. All right. He's saying 24. I'm like, what? All right. Maybe I need to brush up on math. I don't know. But anyway, uh, 32. Okay. And then what about the sixth year? 64. And what about at the end of the seventh year? It's getting a little harder. 128. Okay. Now, did you know that after 10 years, now, now so far, I mean, good night, six, seven years go by, 128 people. I mean, we're not really exactly getting the whole world saved, are we, at that rate? Maybe we should just throw in the towel. Okay, but did you know that if we stick with it, I mean, if we stay with it for just 10 years, 10 years if we stay with it, we'll have 1,024 people saved. That's a lot of people. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good group. Because remember, all these people go soul winning. Okay, the people that we're talking about here. 1,024 people soul winning? That's a, that's a pretty good church. I mean, that's a phenomenal church. And then let's say we take that 1,024 and we just keep going for the next 10 years. Did you know that at the end of 20 years of working God's plan, I remember starting with one, and we're starting with way more than that. Uh, at the end of 20 years, we have over a million people saved. Can you believe that? I mean, you start with one person. We're only getting one saved. Hey, hey, all God's asking you to do, and, and obviously God's not limiting you to one per year. Hey, can you, can you get one person saved in the whole year? You say, I'm just not, I'm not really the spirit, I'm not really one of these, you know, spiritual, you know, I'm not that into church. Hey, why don't you get involved in church? And why don't you get one person saved this year in 2007? And think about this, after 20 years you'd have over a million people saved. Did you know that after 30 years like that, good night, in 30 years I'll, I'll still be fairly young. I'll be a young man. Hey, in 30 years we'd have over a million, I'm, I'm sorry, over a billion, a million was after 20 years. We have over a billion people saved after 30 years. And did you know that after 34 years, every single person in the world will be saved at that rate of growth? Don't tell me that God's plan doesn't work. Don't tell me I'm wasting my time when I win people to the Lord one at a time. I'm not wasting my time at all. This is God's plan. 34 years, the whole world will be saved. What's the moral of the story when we're already starting with a million? We're already starting at year 20. Okay? I mean, far more than a million people are saved in this world, I, I, I venture to guess. I have no clue, nor do you. But can you imagine starting 20 years into it? I mean, 14 years! 10 years! What's the moral of the story, kids? Let me tell you the moral of the story. The moral of the story is that 99% of Christians never went anybody to the Lord in their whole life. That's the true story. That's what you can learn. Look at the numbers. The vast majority is that statistically, you in this room, most of you in this room, will never win one person to the Lord in your whole life. Do you want to be, you want to be that dud that ruins the whole thing? Why don't you decide right now that says people are going to hell in this area, that says people are going to hell all over this world, and you're their only hope. You're the only hope they have to bring them the gospel. Why don't you decide, hey, maybe I can't do great works for God. Hey, maybe I'm never going to stand up in front of thousands of people. Hey, maybe I'm never going to be everything God wants me to be. Hey, I'm never going to be perfect. I'm always going to be a sinner. Hey, maybe I'm never going to repent of all my sins. But I know that I can open my mouth and get one person saved. Hey, anybody in this room can do that. Anybody in this room. You say, well, I, don't, I just don't like confronting people with such a negative message of the gospel. Hey, the gospel's good news. Hey, people are going to hell whether you tell them they're going to hell or not. You're giving them the good news. That they don't have to go to hell no matter who they are. All they have to do is believe. Boy, it's such an inclusive message, isn't it? You think, you think the liberals would love it, wouldn't you? I mean, it's so accepting and loving. I mean, it says anybody can be saved. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter who you are. Hey, anybody can be saved. But why is that the most liberal Christians, why is that the most liberal people of this world are the ones who are the quickest to say, well, you can't just live however you want. You've got to do some works to be saved. I'll tell you why, because they, they believed a lie. I'll tell you why, because they've been blinded by the God of this world, and we need to take the gospel to them and shine the glorious light of the gospel. Everyone that believe it. The gospel is the power of God to everyone that believe it. Whosoever believe it. Whosoever believe it that Jesus is the Christ.
Christ is born of God. Believe the record that God gave his son, you'll be saved. That's not a negative message at all. That's very positive. I remember, I remember when I heard about it, I thought it was great. I remember a six-year-old boy. I was thrilled when I found out the only thing I had to do to go to heaven was just believe the record that God gave of his son and just believe on Jesus Christ. I said, I can do that. Anybody can do that. And not only can anybody can believe that, anybody can tell that to one other person and get them saved. And then go for another one. And then another one. One at a time. And you say, I don't even feel like I'm making a dent in the 7 billion population of this world. Hey, you are doing your part. And you are making a huge dent. I know people who got saved as little kids. People probably saw them get out of church and said, oh, they were never really saved. I know a man who got saved as, a, as an 11-year-old boy. He was out of church for about 40 years. Lived, you know, lived wrong. Wasn't in church. Just li- pretty much just lived, really, not a really wicked life, but just pretty much lived the kind of life that everybody in the world lives. And, uh, you know, after 40 years, he got back in church, and now he's, now he's a soul winner. You know, 40 years later. You don't know what you're doing when you win somebody to the Lord. You don't, know, you don't know what you're accomplishing. You don't know how many hundreds and thousands of people you're getting saved every time you bow your head with one person and open the Bible and show them the gospel. You better, you better learn one thing from this message. Learn one thing from this message. It's what I want you to learn. It doesn't matter whether somebody's heard the gospel or not. It doesn't matter whether they know who Jesus is or not. They will go to hell unless they get the gospel according to the Bible. And you better just realize that. Okay, you better just let that sink down into your heart. And if you let that sink down into your heart, I hope that the love of Christ will constrain you to bring the gospel to those that are in darkness right now. Let's, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.